SLD අලුත් මෙගා ලයින් කනෙක්ෂන් වලට 150ක දීම නා තවත් ඔෆර් ගැන දැනගන්න 1 2 1 2 ක අමතන්න Master stroke of desperation. Sri Lanka's World Cup squad announced. We can't have two off spinners. You take India, Ravichandran Ashwin. They haven't selected him. We are hiding the coach. We have selected the best 50. We have to win. The final frontier. Sri Lanka's first ever satellite takes to space. They just keep coming. Two more Sri Lankans from the Dubai detainees return to the island. Censored but worth it. Robert Mueller's report on Russian collusion in the US presidential election to be released today. All that and much more coming up on First at 9 this Thursday, the 18th of April 2019. From Ada Derana, this is Ada Derana First at 9. Live from Studio 24 in Colombo. Hello, very good evening and welcome to First Set 9 on Other Than 24, Sri Lanka's news channel. I'm Katharina Chang. Now today is another milestone in Sri Lanka's history as the launch of a satellite made its way onto the long list of the country's stellar achievements. There is now Sri Lankan presence in the space with the launch of the satellite dubbed Ravana 1. It is the first ever Sri Lankan satellite to be launched into space and it was set on its way from NASA's Wallops flight facility on Wallops Island, Virginia this morning. Five, four, three, two, one and we have engine ignition and we have liftoff at the Ontario the satellite dubbed Ravana 1 is a research satellite built by two Sri Lankan students from the University of Peradeniya and the Arthur C. Clarke Institute for Modern Technologies the satellite was designed and built at the Kyushu Institute of Technology in Japan by two Sri Lankan students Tarindu Dayaratna and Dulani Chamika Ravana 1 is 1,000 cubic centimetres in size and weighs 1.1 kilograms. It was officially handed over to the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency on 18th of February this year and was sent to the International Space Station yesterday via the US spacecraft Cygnus 1. Ravana 1 is expected to orbit 400 kilometres away from Earth and it will have a minimum lifespan of one and a half years. It is set to be launched into orbit by the end of May or the outset of June. Subsequently, it is expected to orbit the Earth for approximately 15 times per day and its speed is estimated at 7.6 kilometers per second. The satellite is expected to fulfill several missions including the capture of images of Sri Lanka and its surrounding regions. It will also experiment a software system in designing satellites in place of the hardware system that's already being used. Moreover, Ravana 1 will also try the software to function the satellite and download LoRa module that would help design future satellites. Its designers Tarindu and Dulani watched the launch live from the Kyushu Institute of Technology in Japan. The quick change around in Sri Lanka's weather conditions are causing some stir with heavy falls expected to continue in various parts of the island. The Department of Meteorology says that these showers will be accompanied by thunder and lightning with rainfall reaching 100 millimetres. It also moved to issue a weather advisory urging people to say, stay off the coast extending from Matra to Trincomalee via Hambantota and Batiklo as the seas are likely to be very rough. It was not long ago the country was feeling the ill effects of searing heat, but in a short space of time, the island nation is experiencing weather conditions, which is at the other end of the scale, with rains hitting certain parts of the country. The Department of Meteorology expects this shari condition to continue, accompanied by severe lightning activities, owing to an atmospheric disturbance in the vicinity of Sri Lanka. Issuing an advisory on heavy rain and strong winds, the Med Department said that sea areas off the coast extending from Matara to Trincomalee via Hambantota and Batiklo are more likely to be very rough. It urged members of the general public to take adequate precautions to minimize damages caused by lightning activity during thunder showers. 
The Met Department added that showers or thunder showers will occur in most parts of the island, with heavy falls of about 100 millimeters expected at some places in Sabaragamua, Central, Southern, Uwa, Western, and Northwestern provinces, as well as in Anuradhapura and Vaunia districts. Meanwhile, the bridge running across Homa Canal in the area of Kundagala in Udugama was severely damaged due to the incessant rains which fell the locality yesterday. Some damage was also felt in Polo Narwa. Meanwhile, speaking to First at Nine, Assistant Director of Disaster Management Centre Pradeep Kodipili touched on the measures that should be taken during the prevailing deluge, accompanied by severe lightning. This is very important notification for the public. Heavy rain and more than 70 to 80 kilometers per hour wind could be also expected. So actions need to be required to minimize lightning damages. Uh, last week also we got the reports for three deaths because of the lightning damages. And uh, we need to seek uh, shelter, preferably indoors and never under trees. And avoid open areas such as paddy fields and tea plantations. And need to avoid using wire telephones. And be aware with the fallen trees and people need to trim the trees around their house as well and be aware with the strong winds gusty strong winds could be expected Sri Lanka Podujana Perumuna suspects that Field Marshal Sarat Fonseca will be given a portfolio concerning internal affairs with influence over citizenship status of Sri Lankans, alleging that the government had a number of plans to stop former Defence Secretary Gotabi Rajapaksha from contesting in the upcoming presidential election. UPF parliamentarian Kanchana Vijay Sekara also expressed concern that there might be similar plans in the pipelines. The parliamentarian is, however, positive that the former Defence Secretary will overcome all those challenges once the presidential election is called. We have a suspicion that uh, all these cases that have been filed against uh, Gotabe Rajapaksa, the former Defence Secretary, uh, is just to delay the process of him taking a chance to the next uh, presidential elections. So he has taken steps to uh, renunciate his, his uh, dual citizenship and he has done that process. We are quite sure that his lawyers will attend to it. Whatever cases are filed against him in the US, his lawyers will fight it out. And there's also another rumor that Honorable Sarat Fonseca will be given a task, a portfolio, in regards to the interior ministry which relates to the, the citizenship or the dual citizenships of Sri Lankan citizens. All this looks like another attempt, another project catered towards preventing him from contesting the next presidential elections, but we are sure he will overcome all these obstacles and when the elections are named, under the leadership uh, of His Excellency Mahindra Rajapaksa uh, and the SLPP, uh, he will be able to overcome all these obstacles. Two more persons who were arrested in Dubai along with drug lord Mark Andre Madush were deported to Sri Lanka today. The duo was arrested by officials of the CID upon their arrival this morning for interrogations. Meanwhile, Singha Mal Pereira's son Nadi Mal Pereira, who was deported from Dubai on the 27th of last month, was present at the CID headquarters today to record a statement. On the 5th of February, notorious underworld leader Mark Andre Madush and several others, including singer Amal Pereira, were taken into custody by Dubai police over charges relating to drugs at a party. Dubai police took measures to deport arrested Sri Lankans on various intervals. The latest round of deportations saw Pial Pushpa Kumara and M. A. Mohammed Inham being sent back to the island at around 5.55 this morning. The duo was met with officials of the CID at the Bandarnaka International Airport where they were arrested for interrogation. Meanwhile, interrogations of the six suspects who were deported from Dubai and arrested by the CID yesterday are still underway. One of the six suspects was handed over to the Colombo Crimes Division. In the meantime, another from yesterday's round of deportations, Nilan Ramesh Samar Singha, was produced before the Negambo Magistrates Court today as he was a wanted suspect in several pending cases. The Nigambo magistrate ordered the suspect be remanded until the 22nd of this month. Police said that Nilan Ramesh is identified as a cousin of Mark Andre Madush. Meanwhile, singer Amal Pereira's son Nadi Mal Pereira, who was deported last month, was present at the CID headquarters this morning to record a statement following which he left.
In the meantime, Shabdika Vella Pili, the attorney representing singer Amal Pereira, said that the Department of Prosecution in Dubai has issued an order to deport his client Amal Pereira as well. The appeal of the main who is at the centre of the ongoing saga, drug king Pingmaka Andre Madush, seeking an order from Dubai courts preventing his deportation to Sri Lanka was taken up today. Court, however, postponed the verdict until the 2nd of next month. Funerals of the 10 persons, including three children who lost their lives in the pre-dawn collision between a bus and a van in Mahiangan yesterday, were held at their residences in Batiklo today. The collision happened near the Mahiangan National College along the Badula Mahiangan Road. Now, police believe that the driver of the van was at fault as the vehicle had veered onto oncoming traffic. Two other passengers who were inside the van at the time of the collision are still in critical condition and are being treated in the intensive care unit of the Provincial General Hospital in Badulla. Police claimed yesterday that the driver of the bus had not been under the influence and that the bus had travelled on the correct side of the road when the collision occurred. The National Transport Commission, however, said that the passenger service permit issued for the private bus had been suspended for a period of one month. So the Saudi Arabian government has agreed to provide a concessional loan of 187.5 million Saudi rial to Sri Lanka towards the establishment of a fully equipped faculty of medicine at the University of Sabragamwa. The project aims to construct the essentially needed state-of-the-art teaching and learning facilities such as laboratories that would facilitate students with medical education in line with international standards. This program will contribute to the government policy of augmenting opportunities for higher education in the field of medicine. The Minister of Finance stated that the loan was negotiated after a delegation headed by Secretary to the Ministry of Finance Dr. R. H. S. Samratunga and Secretary to the Minister of Higher Education Priyanta Maya Dunne had visited Riyadh earlier this month to engage in necessary discussions in this regard. And with that, we cross over to a short commercial break. Mark, make sure you stay tuned for more news on the other side. You are watching Sri Lanka's number one news channel. This is Adhavarana 24. Minister of Finance Mangla Samravida recently attended the United Nations Economic and Social Council's Forum on Financing for Development and addressed it. Speaking at the forum, the minister explained certain measures taken by Sri Lanka, including in the 2019 budget, to address identified challenges in sustainable and equitable development. The minister urged for greater public-private partnerships and multi-stakeholder initiatives globally to ensure that no citizen is left behind. Because in Sri Lanka, with the rap rapid liberalization of the economy, a strong social safety net has become an absolute necessity over the years, despite having a long history of robust social welfare. In fact, in recent years, the statistical indicators of social equality, I believe, have also moved in the correct or in the right direction. Uh, Gini Coefficient in 2016 was 0 0.45 compared to 0 0.48 in 2012. And the top 20 of income earners accounted for 50.8 of household income in 2016 compared to 52.9 in 2012. The bottom 20% accounted for 4.8% of incomes in 2016 compared to 4.5. Nonetheless, there are emerging challenges that Sri Lanka is at present tackling. For in instance, regional inequalities in post-conflict zones. In fact, having established peace in 2009, the post-conflict situation is become, becoming increasingly better. 
and there was there has also been very significant gender related challenges and also caring for those with special needs and different differently abled people and we believe that uh, that this will uh, that we will be able to achieve the ob ob objective because within the last 6 months itself we have managed to create about uh, nearly 60,000 entrepreneurs under the age of 35. It's very impressive that you've found 60,000 entrepreneurs in uh, in six months. What kind of work are they doing? What kind of companies are they, they setting up that you're able to, to have that kind of startup? In fact, we have identified 12 areas in which they will be uh, assisted in. Uh, but one of the, uh, the more popular uh, areas uh, for these young entrepreneurs uh, have been in the agricultural sector uh, and also in the IT sector. Sri Lanka has uh, uh, basically a very IT literate set of young people. Uh, uh, Minister Samaravira also called on the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, during his visit. During the encounter, stating that he was impressed by the peaceful resolution of the recent political crisis in Sri Lanka, the Secretary General reaffirmed the commitment of the United Nations to continue to support the people of Sri Lanka, including the reconciliation and sustainable development agenda. An improving trend is noted in Sri Lanka's trade deficit with 617 million US dollars being recorded for January this year compared to deficit of 1049 million US dollars for January the previous year. Issuing a data for the external sector performance for the month of January this year, the central bank noted that the country's exports had grown by 7.5% to 1038 million US dollars during the month. In its latest data on Sri Lanka's external sector, the central bank attributed the improving trend of year-on-year -year trade deficit to the combined effect of higher earnings from exports and a notable deceleration in export expenditure, mainly reflecting the impact of policy measures implemented to discourage vehicles and non-essential consumer goods imports. Sri Lanka's earnings from merchandise exports in January this year surpassed 1 billion US dollars for the second consecutive month. Industrial exports had mainly contributed to the growth of export earnings driven by textiles and garments, rubber products, machinery and mechanical appliances, as well as food, beverages and tobacco. For the first time since February last year, earnings from agricultural exports had grown on a year-on-year -year basis in January 2019, mainly due to the growth in coconut, seafood, vegetables and manufactured tobacco exports. Meanwhile, expenditure on year-on-year -year merchandise exports had declined in January of this year for the third consecutive month by 17.8% to 1,655 million US dollars, reflecting the effect of policy measures taken by the central bank and the government. All major import categories such as intermediate goods, consumer goods and investment goods had contributed to this decline. Major inflows to the current account had been insured by tourist arrivals with a growth of 2.2% in January 2019, resulting in 244,239 arrivals during the month, compared to 238,924 arrivals in January last year. With a growth in tourist arrivals, earnings from the tourism sector had increased to $458 million US dollars in the first month of 2019, in comparison to $448 million in January the previous year. The central bank also noted the appreciation of the Sri Lankan rupee by 4.6% against the US dollar this year up to the 17th of April. The OSHA price index edged up as a result of price gains in counters such as Ceylon Tobago Company, Melster Corp and RCD Hospital Holdings with the turnover crossing 200 million rupees. The index ended 0.05% firm at 5,606.35 today. The SMPSO 20 meanwhile closed in red. High net worth and institutional investor participation was witnessed in Ceylon Tobacco Company and Pan Asia Banking Corporation. Turnover came at 200.3 million rupees, nearly a third of this year's daily average of 593.5 million rupees. Foreigners remained active, closing as net buyers with the total foreign purchasers accounted for 58.9% of the turnover. 
Now, during the week, the All Share Price Index gained 0.38%, while the S&P Sl20 lost 0.11%. Average daily turnover for the week was recorded at 187 million rupees. Beverage, food and tobacco sector was the top contributor to the market turnover, while the sector index gained 0.93%. Banks, finance and insurance sector was the second highest contributor to the market turnover, while the sector index decreased by 0.68%. John Keyes Holdings and Dialogue Axiata were also included amongst the top turnover contributors. Meanwhile, in the currency market, the Sri Lankan rupee closed 0.34% firmer, aided by banks a dollar sales today. The currency ended at 173 rupees and 95 cents to 174 rupees and 25 cents to the US dollar, higher than yesterday's close of 174 rupees and 55 to 65 cents. With that, let's now take a look at how the Sri Lankan rupee traded against other currencies during the day. On to one of our headline making news, as Special Counsel Robert Mueller's long awaited report on Russia's role in the 2016 US election will be released later tonight, providing the first public look at the findings of an inquiry that has cast a shadow over Donald Trump's presidency. Mueller charged 34 people and three Russian companies. Those who were convicted or pleaded guilty included figures close to Trump, such as his former campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, and national security advisor, Michael Flynn. Attorney General William Barr's planned release of the nearly 400-page report comes after Special Counsel Robert Mueller wrapped up his 22-month investigation last month into the Donald Trump campaign's contact with Russia and questions of obstruction of justice over the president. Its disclosure with portions expected to be backed out by Barr to protect some sensitive information is certain to launch a new political fight spilling into the halls of Congress and the 2020 presidential campaign trail as Trump seeks re-election in a deeply divided country. The release marks a watershed moment in Trump's presidency, promising new details about some of the biggest questions in the probe, including the extent and nature of his campaign's contacts with Russia and action Trump may have taken to hinder the inquiry, including his 2017 firing of FBI Director James Comey. It also may deepen an already bitter partition rift between Trump's fellow Republicans, most of whom have rallied around the president and his Democratic critics, who will have to decide how hard to go after Trump as they prepare congressional investigations of his administration. Trump has called Mueller's investigation a witch hunt. Some Democrats have spoken of launching impeachment proceedings against Trump in Congress, allowed under the U.S. Constitution to remove a president from office for treason, bribery or other high crimes and misdemeanors. But top Democrats have been notably cautious. Facebook admits that it has unintentionally uploaded the email contacts of more than 1.5 million users without asking permission to do so. The data harvesting happened via a system used to verify the identity of new members. Facebook asked new users to supply the password for their email account and took a copy of their contacts. Facebook said it had now changed the way it handled new users to stop contacts being uploaded. The social media site, however, ensured that all those users who co whose contacts were taken would be notified and all the contacts it had grabbed without consent would be deleted. The information grabbed is believed to have been used by Facebook to help map social and personal connections between users. The email contacts case is the latest in a long series in which Facebook has mishandled data of some of its billions of users.
Perform Peruvian President Alan Garcia died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head as police were preparing to arrest him yesterday. Now, his death was confirmed by current President Martin Vizcara, who expressed his condolences over Twitter. Former Peruvian President Alan Garcia, who served as president from 1985 to 1990 and from 2006 to 2011, was under investigation for money laundering and taking bribes in connection with a massive corruption scandal that has engulfed a number of former Latin American leaders. When police arrived to execute an arrest warrant at his home yesterday, Garcia had said that he wanted to call his attorney and go to his bedroom. Moments later, a gunshot had been heard and officers forced entry into the bedroom where they found Garcia with a wound to the head. Garcia was accused of receiving kickbacks from one of Latin America's largest construction firms, the Brazil-based company Odebrecht, during the construction of an electric train for the Lima Metro while he was president during his second term, an allegation he had denied. The corruption scandal, one of the biggest in modern history, implicated several former Latin American presidents. At least 28 people are dead and another 28 are injured after a tour bus crashed on Portugal's Madeira Island. Most of the casualties were German. The bus had been going down a steep road when it lost control and went down a cliff. The cause of the crash was not yet clear. Now, taking to Twitter, Portuguese Prime Minister Antonio Costa uh, expressed his condolences to German Chancellor Angela Merkel over the accident. We will now cross over to a short commercial break. You are watching Sri Lanka's number one news channel. This is Other Therana 24. On some rugby news, captain of Ireland and Ulster Rory best plans to retire from professional rugby after the World Cup in Japan this year. 36-year-old hooker who made the announcement today played his first match for Ireland back in 2005 and has won 116 caps. He has also won the Six Nations four times, including Grand Slams in 2009 and 2018. Best won the Pro 12 with Ulster in 2006 and has scored 23 tries in 219 appearances for the club following his debut. And with that, we conclude this session of First at Nine. Thank you for joining us and have a pleasant evening.